I don't know much about running the best business. I don't know much about stocks. And sometimes I can't even find my glasses. But if there's one thing that I know, it's how to make money trading crypto, which is exactly what we're going to be doing in this video. I've been investing in trading for almost 10 years. I first started out in 2015 trading stocks, and then I withdrew my entire portfolio and moved it into crypto in November 2017. And now I manage a six figure portfolio. This video is going to be pure crypto wisdom from experiencing multiple bull and bear markets to almost losing everything trading and more. And yes, this video is going to be a slightly longer video. If you can't sit still and watch to the end, you're probably not going to make it in crypto. I'm going to go over the principles and rules for making it in crypto. These are principles that are universal no matter what point of the cycle we're in and will continue to hold true for the next 20 years. When I got into crypto for the first time back in November 2017, Bitcoin was trading at around around $17,000, nearing its then all-time high of $19,800, reached just one month later. The market sentiment was euphoric, with many investors and enthusiasts claiming that Bitcoin was the future of money and that its price would continue to rocket up higher. Everyone who held crypto were showing off their Lamborghinis and how much money they were making. Following the all-time high just shy of 20K in December 2017, Bitcoin's price began to decline. Throughout 2018, the price continued to fall, reaching a low of approximately $3,200 in December 2018. This represented an 84% drop from the all-time high and marked a prolonged period of market downturn. Everyone was saying that Bitcoin is dead, crypto is dead, the market is never going to come back, there is no more money that will flow into the markets. One thing that most people don't understand though about bear markets is that they're usually prolonged periods where the price moves sideways for the longest time and everyone is tapped out at the news, focusing their energy elsewhere, waiting for things to recover. In 2019, the market slowly recovered and 2020 came with a new bull market thanks to some money printing and stimulus checks by the United States government. Bitcoin hit an all-time high of $69,000 and we saw yet another top. And in 2022, we saw yet another bear market with Luna and FTX collapsing. Bitcoin collapsed to as low as $15,000. Now we're seeing some recovery with Bitcoin recently making an all-time high as of the filming of this video. Bitcoin moves in cycles, just like any other market. The Wall Street cheat sheet is one of the most reposted images when it comes to trading, whether it's crypto, stocks, bonds, forex, whatever. This thing is legit, and we're going to spend a little bit of time breaking this down because I need you to burn this image into your brains because this is going to save you so much time, grief, energy, and money. Take a look at the top right corner. It shows a simplified market cycle. This is the easiest way to look at charts. And honestly, if all charts move like this, we'd all be millionaires by now. But the truth is that markets have two main events. There's a peak and then there's a trough or a valley. Once the price gets really excited, we reach a peak, a top price. And then after that happens, we start to go down more and more and more because there's fear and greed at play in the market. There's supply and demand. And once the price reaches a new extreme high, there won't be any buyers left to buy at that extremely high price anymore. No one deems it valuable anymore. If it can't go up, it's going to go down. People that bought in years or months ago or last week are going to start selling as they see the price go down. This is the part of the market where you're actually going to be better off learning how to use futures markets. By shorting the market, you can actually hedge your portfolio. You can hold on to your Bitcoin. You can hold on to your Solana, your Cardano, and you can short the market as it falls down. So as the value of Cardano, Bitcoin, Solana falls, by shorting the market, you're actually going to be booing your portfolio. You're going to be making money as the market falls. It's a wonderful thing. Let's go on to the main part of this chart, working from left to right. The first thing about this chart that you'll notice is that we always start with this little bit of hope. But before that hope, there's one more drop. We've seen this happen so many times for Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Dogecoin. It's happened every single market, every single time on larger time frames and smaller time frames. But keep in mind that this cheat sheet is meant to be used on larger time frames. While you can can use this on smaller time frames. This is really meant for more of a macro global view of markets. So first we have this disbelief rally after getting a quick pullback, which flushes out the last of the believers, the last of the, Ooh. then we start to see shimmering, glimmering signs of hope. And that hope is enough for the people that have been holding on forever to get them a little bit more excited. As that begins to build, then we switch into optimism. This is where people that had recently sold start kicking themselves and they decide to buy back in. This happens all over the place. And this is why 
I prefer DCA style trading compared to having a hard and fixed stop loss, depending on the market, depending on the instrument, whether it's spot or futures, there is a difference. But for the most part, this is why DCA trading works so well. Because when everyone else sold their bags, when things got super fearful, when people were feeling depressed, you bought the dip and you're just patiently waiting. So when the market starts to turn more optimistic, notice how fast that we start to move up higher and higher. Optimism quickly turns into belief, which turns into thrill, which turns into euphoria. The amount of time from these four stages, optimism, belief, thrill, euphoria, is so short. And this is what we call a parabola. A parabola is actually a mathematical term for basically a chart or any sort of drawing, a measurement, but where it starts to increase rapidly in a very short amount of time, and it's extremely overpriced really quick. So if we're thinking about time and price like this graph is showing us, optimism, belief, thrill, euphoria, these four things are happening sometimes in a matter of weeks. If we look at the price for Bitcoin back in the 2020 bull run, we could see that the first impulse after it broke above 20K, it was pretty quick. It grew about 15 or $20,000 quickly up to about 35 or $40,000. And then after each pullback, there was a little bit of a reduced rally, we could call it. So when we see that first impulse, that's our first really big push to new highs. And that's when the market participants get really excited. But after that pullback, you'll see that the next rallies that we have get a little bit less. People have made their money, but less people are willing to buy at these higher prices. And that's what we're looking at between euphoria and complacency. Now note that we could see belief to complacency repeat over and over and over again. When we look at the 2016 to 2017 bull market for Bitcoin, that's exactly what we saw. That was an extended bull market that lasted about 18 months. It lasted for almost a year and a half. It was massive. And I got in on the tail end of it. But for some of you OGs out there that have been trading Bitcoin and holding it or trading crypto for a long time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The trick to knowing when these are going to be cooling off is having a extreme sharp decline. When we look at the 2020, rather the 2021 bear market summer, where Bitcoin crashed from approximately 60K down to 30K, that's the kind of crash that should wave a lot of red flags. If we look at the chart again, that's the crash from euphoria just before complacency. That huge crash right there is usually what tells market participants, whoa, there's a lot of weakness in this chart. While people that are still frothing at the mouth for Bitcoin or whatever crypto coin it is are feeling more complacent, like, oh, we just need another push up higher. The reality is that that first flush, especially if it's a major flush, a one day candle, especially in crypto that's greater than 20%, that's your cue that when the price comes back up, that's your chance to sell. You may not be able to sell the top and most of the time we can't, but we can use the market as an indication of what's happening. And when we see that parabola happening, you better believe that you should be selling on that increase in price. Because if you're not, you're going to be stuck on the sidelines, holding the bag all the way through the bear part of this chart. And let's look at that. The period from complacency to anxiety happens where it's a pullback that's deeper than the first one from euphoria to just before complacency. When the chart starts to drag lower and lower, and that's another cue. It's a cue to tell you that things aren't looking so hot. There aren't enough people to buy. And the chart is feeling indifferent right now about the price action, that level of complacency. And then anxiety starts to drop it a little bit further, more abrupt. And then denial, we see a little bit more of a drop further. And then finally panic hits. And then the golden moment, capitulation. This is the moment where we're looking for our ultimate bottom. But note that capitulation does not mean the market bottom. What capitulation means is that sellers have been so exhausted that people have realized, wait a second, this was worth that much before. And now it's this cheap. I'm going to buy as much as I can of this. If we use the chart of Bitcoin, we can even see just looking at volume from the top in 2021 November to the bottom, well, the first capitulation bottom in June 2022, it's clear as day that that was actually the capitulation. That was pure capitulation because you can see the price forming a V-shaped bottom, just like we have here on the Wall Street chart. And then it started to grind sideways. Like I said before, bear markets can be drawn out. Sometimes they can last for a couple months. Sometimes they can even last for a year. It just depends. But bear markets are signified by hitting a support level over and over and over again until finally there's enough of uh, a feeling of comfort and safety in the price or rather the asset itself. It's also normal after capitulation to see one last drop. And in my opinion, that was definitely November 2022. That drop really wasn't supposed to happen. But because of the FTX fallout, because of their bankruptcy, that shot Bitcoin's price from about 23K down to 15K in a matter of days. When those events happen, the market is just angry, flat out angry. They're pissed off. Everyone's yelling on Twitter. Everyone's freaking out on YouTube. Those are the moments actually where you want to flip the 
script. When you see that there is a bunch of anger and fear and frustration in the market, that's actually a good sign to buy. It's a cycle. And as all cycles play out and starts to revolve, just like a merry-go-round, you're eventually going to come back to that point where we had this max pain and then we're going to go back to max euphoria. It's going to take a lot longer for that cycle to play out. And with Bitcoin, it's specifically a four-year cycle. But after we hit that last drop for anger, you can see that the price just starts to drag lower and lower and we see it slowly start to come up from depression. Well, depression is usually going to be late because this is going to be an extended bear market. We saw that in 2022 is an extremely long bear market. We saw that back in 2014 and 15. That was a long bear market. 2018 to 2019, was brutal. Bitcoin sat on the 6K shelf for so many months until finally in November 2018, it broke it and went all the way down to about $3,500 in December 2018. That was a brutal last move. But when the price found its capitulation bottom, it started to chop for another couple of months. When we look at 2022, it hit the bottom. It stayed down there about $15,000 or so for about a month. It's normal to stay down in this goblin town. The worst feeling ever is in this little moment after the capitulation where there's hope it gets crushed again and we're staying down here. But this is the best time to buy. When we start to get a rally, like we saw most recently in January and February 2023, most people are going to miss out on this rally. It's going to be a quick shot of euphoria and it's going to feel like, oh man, we're so back, we're so back until we have all these little dips in the road. Now with Bitcoin, it's never going to be the same. We're never going to be able to copy and paste this chart and superimpose it over the price of Bitcoin. But looking at the cycle of how this is structured with this chart, cheat sheet. We can learn so much about what to expect when we're reaching the next bull market or the next bear market. Every market is the same and the bull market will return, even if it doesn't seem that obvious when crypto is down bad. And that is principle number one. Just like in any other financial market, history repeats itself. Which brings me to principle two, an obvious but often overlooked one. Without having gone through a bear market, it's difficult to understand what it looks like or what it feels like to be in one. Your portfolio may be down by 50%. You may be holding on to some garbage coins from the previous bull market that have gone to zero because the market collapsed. And everyone will say that crypto is dead. Bitcoin is never going to recover and that it will be years before we see money flowing back into the crypto markets. There will be no trust in crypto and the price will never move up. Month after month, the Bitcoin price will stay about the same and it'll go up by 10% and everyone thinks it's going to rally and then it'll drop back down 10% or even worse, make new lows. For example, when Bitcoin crashed from $69,000 to $20,000, everyone was saying that crypto was dead. The price was moving between 20 k and 23 k for a few months, and honestly, not much was happening. And then, for a short period, it rallied back to 26 k And of course, then FTX went bankrupt, which sent Bitcoin crashing all the way down to $15,000. And then everyone was saying that Bitcoin would crash even further down to 10 k It was feeling like the bull run would be years away, but in reality, reality, Bitcoin rocketed up to a new all-time high just a year later. In 2008, during the crash of the housing market with Lehman Brothers, housing prices plummeted and millions of families were left homeless. Everyone was saying that the real estate market would not recover and the stock market would take years to recover. But actually, if you bought real estate or stocks in 2008, you would be part of one of the greatest runs of all time where the market kept going up until about 2022. Or if you witnessed the dot-com crash and all the the internet companies were at an all-time low. Buying Amazon at that time wouldn't have been such a bad idea. The hard truth is that many of you won't be able to buy the bottom or time it perfectly to get in at the very lowest price possible but you don't have to buy the exact bottom to be a profitable trader. As long as you buy near the bottom or even after the price has bottomed out and you don't mind holding for a few weeks or months, then you'll be just fine. In regards to crypto, bear markets usually last about a year, so you can try and time it out and set a calendar reminder to check back in on the market a year later, but chances are you're going to miss the chance to buy as prices are falling. Back when Bitcoin fell to 20K in June 2022, that's honestly where I bought the majority of my my Bitcoin. It wasn't the ultimate bottom, but it was still an excellent entry. When it fell a little bit farther down to 15K, I bought a little more. The key here is to decide early on where and how much you're going to buy. Don't expect for a minute that you'll just be able to feel it out and trust your gut. Nope, your gut's going to be telling you that the price is likely going to fall a lot more. You're going to feel like this was a terrible entry. Go with that feeling. You have to learn to listen to your emotions when the market is at its extremes and 
just do the opposite. That's why principle two is when there's blood in the streets, buy. The next principle is one that most beginners often fall prey to. After buying a good chunk of Bitcoin a few years ago, I decided to enter a trade to increase my BTC holdings. So I bought a coin called ZRX. It wasn't necessarily a bull market at that time, but it seemed like a really good coin to trade. So I bought a little bit. The price bounced just a little bit, which made me get a little bit too giddy and excited since I was using way more size than I usually did. And then the price started going against me. Bitcoin started rallying higher, which meant that ZRX was falling hard. I'm a seasoned DCA trader, so I checked the chart and I looked for good buy levels and placed some DCA orders. For those that don't know what I'm talking about, DCA means dollar cost averaging, which means I was buying more ZRX as the price fell. But my DCA strategy is a bit aggressive. I double down on every order. So I found a good level of support and placed my DCA order and the price fell further. I zoomed out more and placed another order, the price fell further again. By this point, I had invested a much bigger chunk than I wanted to of Bitcoin into this trade and was starting to question my sanity. I had used DCA hundreds of times before, but this time, this particular trade, it was really starting to mess with my head. I started to freak out and felt like giving up. Days turned into weeks, which turned into months of holding this one position. I felt like a huge loser, but I knew deep down that the strategy hasn't failed me yet and it wouldn't fail me now. After weeks of waiting, the price finally started to pick up and my take profit targets actually got hit. The payday was massive, over $15,000 worth of Bitcoin made in this one trade. And here's the sting. Originally, I had way higher targets for this, but I got fearful and panicked and I lowered my targets and missed out on even bigger gains. Even though I held on to my mantra of I will be satisfied with any amount of profit, and I was extremely relieved that my position closed in the green, it was definitely not worth the pain and anguish of holding that position for such a long time. You need to remember that the primary goal of investing in crypto is to make money. Principle four is one that many crypto investors are notoriously known to be terrible at. Early on in my crypto trading career, it was the days of ICOs or initial coin offerings. These were similar to IPOs or initial public offerings, which are common in the stock market. Companies wanting to raise funds before going public on the stock market will sell shares at a discounted price. Typically, early investors get in on the ground floor at a super cheap discount and can turn a profit quickly after the company goes public. Crypto startups and companies tried this same approach in 2017 with mixed success. While some investors were able to hit the jackpot and get into some amazing early entry prices, most investors bought into vaporware. I tried investing in ICOs early on and used my Ethereum to secure a big bag of nothing. It was a mistake that cost me thousands, but thankfully I didn't invest everything I had. I knew that ICOs were risky, that there was never a sure thing no matter how good it sounded. Then there were other investment opportunities that some people bought into early and made millions from it, like Hex. Richard Hart's Hex token had a meteoric rise in 2021, reaching an all-time high of over 50 cents after rocketing up nearly 1 million percent. Early investors in Hex committed to a staking protocol that Richard Hart devised to encourage people to buy and stake, not sell, their holdings and earn interest on it for a locked period of up to 10 years. While it might have felt amazing to see the value of your staked hex shoot up 1 million percent. The unfortunate truth about any market is that nothing ever goes up into the right forever. As of the filming of this video, hex has fallen over 99% since its all time high. It's still up 12,000% or so, but that's a big drop for people who went all in on hex without the ability to sell or take profits on the way up. Worse yet is putting too much money into a new listing. This is actually a great strategy in very specific periods and markets, particularly after a Bitcoin halving or during Bitcoin's major bull runs, this could easily be a terrible investment that keeps tumbling all the way down to Goblin Town. Can you imagine buying Onyx coin in June of 2022? This chart alone is down 97%, but it actually fell to as low as 99.27%, from 9 cents all the way down to 0.00068. The lesson here is that while crypto is one of the best risk-adjusted investments you can make with a lot of upside potential, you 
have to diversify your portfolio. Sure, you can make some decent money with the next ICO or hex or new listing, but definitely don't go all in on these types of investments. And if you do make some money from them after only investing a little bit, do not kick yourself either. I actually shared a suggested portfolio allocation for the 2024 crypto bull run, but to be honest, this can be used for the next 20 years. Here's the shortened version of it. Allocation is everything when it comes to crypto. While you can go 100% in anything you really want to, you're susceptible to a lot of drawdown and a lot of risk if you're just going all in. So I've taken the time to share this with you because I want you to understand that there is a lot that you can gain from diversifying intelligently. We're actually going to work up to the top 30%, which is probably going to surprise you. So we're going to start down here 10%. And that's new listings. New listings have to do with any coin that has never been listed before on a centralized exchange. So new listings, they have no price action history, which is actually the best thing. And there's also a lot of uncertainty about what it could do. There are some new listings that immediately go down and drop and drop. Some of them actually pump higher and higher and higher. How do you know what's going to happen? Well, you honestly never know what's going to happen with a new listing. There's a lot of risk involved, which is why I only allocate 10% for new listings. But here's the thing. There's a time to do this. When Bitcoin is bullish, when you see that the trend is up, the markets are happy, this is a safer time for you to buy new listings because these coins with no prior history can shoot up 100%, 200%, 500% in a matter of days or even weeks. The second time that's actually really, really good for buying new listings is after the Bitcoin halving. You might have to wait six to nine months for these to actually hit the bottom, but this is why DCA works. This is why it's so important. So even if we're looking at 10% of our total portfolio's value or worth, don't put just 10% into one coin. Like maybe split that 10% up into two or three coins and then don't even go full into that one position. If you have $1,000 to play with, don't put $100 into a new listing and just one. That's it. It's better to spread out among a couple and even start smaller. Don't go with that full $100. Maybe put like $50 if you're just going to do one. Do $50 on that new one new listing at the initial price. And then if it falls further, well, you have more money to put in as the price falls down, which is actually going to be to your advantage because that's how DCA works. The second most advantageous time, again, is after the Bitcoin halving, but more like six to nine months after the Bitcoin halving happens. And that's typically when we see a massive altcoin run or an alt season. The next 20% allocation I want to talk to you about here is AI coins. AI coins pertain to anything involving artificial intelligence. NVIDIA has been doing an amazing job of pushing these chips and making these innovative steps forward for the future of AI. AI is here to stay, whether you like it or not. The best thing that we can do as traders and investors is figure out how can we invest in some of this technology so that way we can grow our portfolios. We want to profit from this AI boom that we're seeing right now. And given that AI is still in its infancy, I don't see this changing. I think AI is going to be very big where we're talking about chip manufacturers. We're talking about companies popping up out of the blue, just here, there and everywhere. This is not going to be out of the realm of possibility for it to happen in crypto too. Specifically, Render announced a partnership or rather secretly announced a partnership with Apple. Yes. Apple. Render has actually been working with Apple to speed up the graphics processors on their iPads. This is news that came out and it wowed the crypto community because Render wasn't really talking about it. But they confirmed that, yes, this is true. This is not going to slow down. While the coins that are hot right now, like Render, Fetch AI, or Arkham are hot, this could change. It depends on what happens with the market. It depends on what happens with the, the whole narrative of this. But make sure to keep 20% of your portfolio available and invested into AI coins. The next 20% should leave you laughing just a little bit. And as silly as this may seem, 20% for meme coins seems like a lot. Some of you, 20% is not enough. The reason why we want to have exposure to meme coins is that a meme, meaning any sort of funny GIF or JPEG, some sort of image of a frog, dog, or a cat. Why is it always animals? But sometimes it's Wojak, sometimes it's Pepe. Memes are here to stay. Crypto, like it or not, as much as you want it to be a really, want it to be a really polished space, it's pretty much full of a bunch of degens. And when we think about degens, we think about really lowbrow humor and stuff like that, which is why memes work well. The other part of memes is that it's a very, very infectious phenomenon where there will be periods where it's really hot and then it gets quiet and then it gets hot again. Memes itself has narratives and sub memes and sub narratives inside of it. It's kind of weird, but it's very, very, very infectious and it grows rapidly. How do you approach this? I don't suggest going on to a theory 
Ethereum or Base or Solana, just buying whatever is newly listed, you're going to want to wait a little bit to see. You won't get in on the ground floor, and that's honestly not where you want to get in on some of these coins because sometimes they get rugged. Sometimes the developers say, hell, oh, thanks for the liquidity. I'm taking it and putting it in my back pocket or the project is abandoned. You want to stick with memes that are tried and tested and true. Memes like Dogecoin, Pepe, Whiff, Bonk. I know these are all ridiculous tickers and memes, but honestly, these ones have proven themselves to be decent. They're actually holding up and they have a lot of trading volume and their market cap is nothing to laugh at. Bigger than a lot of our net worth combined. The next 10% is debatable because some of you have different opinions about this and this might be a polarizing pick, but I'll give my a reason why I think that you should have at least 10% of your portfolio allocated to Ethereum. I say it's polarizing because Ethereum does have many competitors. Ethereum is a layer one token. Actually, Bitcoin is a layer one token too, but there are other layer one tokens that are considered to be rivals or competitors to Ethereum. The main one at the moment that's the primary competitor is Solana. I say that because you could say, well, I want to put 10% of my portfolio to Solana. Go for it. That's fine. But the main thing is that you want to find an effective layer one token. And the reason I have Ethereum here and not Solana is because Ethereum has stayed in the market number two market cap spot. It hasn't moved. It hasn't budged from that market number two spot. Just like I don't think Bitcoin's ever going to move from the number one spot. I would be shocked if that actually happens in the future. Ethereum has been around the longest. That's not to say that it has to stay there. There could be a flippening where Solana actually outperforms and takes the number two spot, but it still has a long way to go. But whatever you choose, whether it's Ethereum or Solana, you do need to have some exposure to layer one tokens like Ethereum or like Solana. This next one should not be a surprise, but the reality is that you're not going to make a whole lot of money from this allocation, but that's why we have only 10% allocated to it. And that's going to be Bitcoin. The reason why Bitcoin only has a 10% allocation is that the idea behind this portfolio allocation diagram is that we want to make money trading crypto. And the unfortunate truth is that Bitcoin does not make significant gains in short little spurts. A really good day in crypto right now, excuse me, a really good day for Bitcoin right now is it's closing up 5%. That's a massive day. Everyone's really excited. Whereas when I got started in crypto, Bitcoin moving up 25% was like, whoa, this is an amazing day. Yeah, it happened. And Bitcoin dropping 30, 35, 40% in a day, that happened too. It goes both sides. There are two sides of the same coin. But Bitcoin is here to stay. I do not see Bitcoin ever shrinking down into nothing. There is too much behind it. Too many publicly listed companies are buying it, investing it. They've launched spot ETF for Bitcoin specifically. Countries are adopting it as fiat currency as were other tradable currency. Bitcoin's here to stay. The one thing I'm not showing you in this little portfolio allocation diagram is that you really want to flip those profits into Bitcoin. Initially, if we're starting from scratch, this is what I would do, honestly. But as you get more profits from trading egg coins, from meme coins, from new listings, I want to rotate those profits and buy Bitcoin because Bitcoin is going to be around in 10 years. Bonk? Probably not. Whiff? Probably not not. Render? Maybe. But Bitcoin? I can bet my money on Bitcoin. And I think Bitcoin is going to be worth a whole lot more in 10 to 20 years time. So that's why even though we're only putting a 10% allocation, the whole idea behind this portfolio allocation is that we want to make money. And if we put 100% into Bitcoin, we might be able to pull a 3x maybe. But as Bitcoin appreciates over time, it's going to make smaller moves over time. It's more mature, more liquidity, but means it's more stable, which is good. But it means that the moves are going to be a lot smaller. So just hear me out here on the whole 10% thing. I I think it's actually a good idea to start. Now, as you grow your portfolio and you allocate more to it, good job for you. And you're going to put some of that in a cold wallet. You're going to put it offline. I'm going to talk to you about that in a second. Understand that you need to accumulate Bitcoin long term. That should be your goal. So take those profits, rotate it into Bitcoin and then move it off exchanges. So that way you continue to grow it for the future. We've talked about new listings, AI coins, meme coins, Ethereum, Bitcoin. What could you possibly want to allocate 30% of your portfolio? to, and it's not one of these things. This is probably going to shock a lot of you, and that is stable coins. The reason why I say you want to allocate 30% of your portfolio in something like stable coins, which would be USDC, USD, USDT, some form of cryptocurrency that's pegged to the US dollar is because it's the US dollar. Like it or not, it's the world's strongest reserve currency for the time being. But 
the reason why more important than that is that when there are pullbacks and they will happen, we will see severe pullbacks as the bull run or bear market gets more intense. In a bull market, we see the price shoot up a lot and we're also going to have severe pullbacks. In a bear market, we're going to see our portfolios dwindle lower and lower and lower. But if you keep a good chunk of your portfolio in stables, the idea behind this is that it helps to buoy your portfolio, where when we have these big massive pullbacks, you're prepared for the pullback so that way you can buy more AI coins, meme coins, Ethereum, and then trade it on the bounce, take that profit, put it back into stables or keep some of it, but keep that balance of having at least 30%, a third of your portfolio in stable coins. This sounds ridiculous. It's going to sound even more ridiculous when the markets are super duper happy, very bullish. Everything's going euphoric and going parabolic. Here's the thing. When you're not allocating stable coins in your portfolio, you have no stable coins, you're all in on crypto. There's a problem there because you won't have any funds to buy any sort of dip. Or if that was the top, now you're kind of stuck. You're hoping that things will retrace up higher. It's not a good place to be. It's much better to keep your portfolio buoyed with stable coins. Flip it to a bear market. In a bear market, as we're seeing prices go lower and lower, there's more bad news. We're seeing prices crash. We've allocated 30% of our portfolio. Arguably, when it's a bear market, you want to sell a large position of your coins, meme coins, Bitcoin, and Ethereum or around the top. So that way you're mostly in stables. So I would actually flip this to like 70%, but 70% because you want to wait through that cycle. So that way you can buy near the bottom. So you can take your profits from the bull market, reinvest at the bottom, play the whole cycle again. And this only happens if you allocate a good chunk of your portfolio to stable coins. And that's why the fourth principle is diversify investments and don't put all your eggs in one basket. Principle five is the most obvious. Most people don't go through the small trouble to keep their investments safe. Everyone has the tendency to leave their money on centralized exchanges like BitGet, Bybit, Binance, Coinbase, etc. And rightfully so. It's convenient, it's easy to access your coins, and it's easy to trade on them. They have been trusted pillars of the crypto community. They have millions to billions of dollars in volume traded on them for the longest amount of time. You'd think that they are safe platforms and can be trusted. But if there's one thing that you can learn from crypto or traditional finance as a whole is that there is no such thing as too big to fail. Mt. Gox, responsible for 70% of all Bitcoin transactions in 2013, collapsed in 2014 after 850,000 Bitcoin were stolen. Cryptopia, a crypto exchange, shut down following a massive hacking incident where cyber criminals stole substantial amounts of digital assets. Despite efforts to regain control, the breach led to irreparable damage, causing the exchange to collapse and leaving users devastated by the loss of their funds. Quadriga CX, a crypto exchange, collapsed after its CEO, Gerald Cotton, allegedly died, leaving $190 million in cryptocurrency inaccessible. Investigations revealed mismanagement and suspicions of fraud as Cotton's death raised questions about his disappearance. Celsius went bankrupt, leaving millions without their deposited coins. Allegations of mismanagement and regulatory violations fueled distrust, prompting a rush of withdrawals and government scrutiny, exacerbating the financial fallout for users. BlockFi, a crypto lending platform, faced bankruptcy amidst allegations that it became over leveraged due to risky trading strategies involving FTX and Alameda Research. The fallout led to financial turmoil, leaving investors in a precarious position. In one of the most significant scandals in crypto history, FTX's founder and CEO, Sam Bankman-Fried, allegedly embezzled a staggering $8 billion of customer funds. He purportedly diverted these funds to fuel the trading activities of Alameda Research, a sister company, in a brazen act of financial malfeasance. Understand that anything can go to zero, and there is no such thing as too big to fail. Centralized exchanges are not to be trusted. No matter how long they've been around, no matter how likable the CEO is or how funny their tweets are, not your keys, not your crypto. Now, admittedly, I store a good chunk of my portfolio on crypto exchanges. Emphasis on is. That way, if an exchange collapses or runs into trouble with a government agency, at least you still have funds on another exchange. Note that I said I store a good chunk of my portfolio on exchanges, not all of it. I keep the majority of my crypto portfolio off of exchanges, and I highly recommend you to do the same. While this does limit the amount of trading capital you have access to, think of it like a long-term nest egg. I actually take a percentage of my profits each month after tallying up my PNL, my 
my profit and loss and send a percentage to my cold wallet. A cold wallet is actually not a crypto wallet like the one you're sitting on or that's probably messing up your spine like George Costanza. A cold wallet is actually a key with a phrase of 12 random words that keeps your funds safe on the blockchain. It's cold because this wallet is not actively connected to the internet. Conversely, a hot wallet is connected to the internet. And these are typically wallets that you can download to your computer, your smartphone, or a tablet. If you send funds to a cold wallet like Ledger, which is what I use, my funds aren't actually stored on this device. But in order for me to move my funds to an exchange or another wallet, I need my Ledger to approve the transaction. It's important to never use your cold wallet to interact with links or to be treated as a hot wallet because it can be compromised. NFT God, an influencer in the NFT space, experienced a severe hack because he used his cold wallet as a hot wallet by entering his seed phrase insecurely, making it vulnerable to attacks. Additionally, he clicked on suspicious links while attempting to download software, which allowed malware to infect his system. This mistake led to significant financial losses and compromised the security of his digital accounts and follower trust. Which brings me to principle five, not your keys, not your crypto. The sixth principle is one that you need to understand if you want to maximize your gains in the upcoming and honestly, any bull market. To understand how you can make the most amount of money in the crypto market or any market, you have to understand the flow of money. You can invest the majority of your money in Bitcoin, but by now, even when Bitcoin hits $150,000, you would get a little less than a 3x. The reason that we're in crypto is because crypto is known for its volatility and its potential to get us 10, 20, 100, or even 1,000x gains on the right coins. But if you want to get into the market at the exact right time where you can maximize your gains, you have to know which point of the cycle we're at. You've probably seen this chart somewhere, either on Twitter or X or Instagram or YouTube or Reddit. This chart is shared all over the place for good reason. The earliest I can remember this concept of this chart before this chart even existed was back in 2018. Understanding that cryptocurrency has a cyclical nature will help you immensely growing your portfolio faster than you normally would. Bitcoin is great. You should aim to accumulate at least one Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the first thing to rally. When Bitcoin rallies, usually alts will follow with it. When Bitcoin starts to rally hard, alts probably won't be able to keep up. As it says right here, the flow of money moves into Bitcoin, causing prices to surge when Bitcoin starts to rally hard. And when I say hard, I mean printing days where it's like closing five, six, eight, ten percent candles per day. That's the time to be focusing only on Bitcoin. You're going to be tempted to use your Bitcoin to trade things like Ethereum, like Solana, like Doge. Don't. When Bitcoin is strong and bullish and rallying up higher, these tokens typically can't keep up with the price of Bitcoin. So what do you do? You keep your assets in Bitcoin. You just ride the wave and you enjoy it as it goes up higher because your portfolio is going to be growing. Once Bitcoin starts to struggle to move up higher, you're going to see it start to just kind of lose steam. What's happening there is it's going to be a transition, a change of hands. It's almost like a merry-go-round. Once we've seen Bitcoin do its big move, we're going to get this slingshot effect. And what happens is typically we see a Ethereum move next. Sometimes Bitcoin and Ethereum are going to move in tandem at the same time. Sometimes Ethereum is going to actually move up first, then that will help Bitcoin to follow. So this chart is dated in that this was true a couple of years ago, but don't take this for gospel. Understand that Bitcoin and Ethereum can move in tandem. Bitcoin might lead Ethereum. Ethereum might lead Bitcoin, but they're pretty close together. If Bitcoin's going to perform really well, expect Ethereum to do so as well. It's not going to perform to the same degree. When we see Bitcoin move up 10%, expect Ethereum to move up like like seven or eight percent. If Ethereum is leading the market moving up 15, Bitcoin might move up eight or 10 percent. We're thinking about this trickling down. When we have this big bucket of money filled up in Bitcoin at the very top, eventually the bucket is going to start to overflow and that overflow is going to go into Ethereum. Now what's happening is that all of these investors that made money with Bitcoin, they're taking their gains, buying Ethereum, and then they're making money with Ethereum, taking that money and they're buying large caps. Then they're taking that money and then they're pouring it into other things. I define large caps as anything between the top number three market cap spot all the way down to about the top 20. Crypto has a ranking system with the top market cap. Whether you're looking on CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko, you're going to see this in play. These numbers
numbers, everything below number one and two change a lot. They change depending on the sentiment. Maybe there are more meme coins in the top 10 and it actually happens more often than you think. Maybe we're going to see a shift for AI tokens being in the top 10 tokens. We saw lots of exchange tokens in the top 10 market caps. Large caps, again, are anything from the number three spot to number 20. But notice that it's trickling down from number one to number two to the top 20 or so. And then what happens is those prices start to rise. It's going to be a quick transition. Usually these phases that are listed here, phase one, two, three, four, it's not like everyone's watching the price go up and then we move to the next one. Then we watch that one go up. Then we move to the next one. No, if that were the case, I wouldn't be making this video right now. I would be in the Seychelles sipping a nice little Mai Tai on the beach, enjoying all of these fronds being fanned at me. We'd all be millionaires, but this is just to give you an idea of how the market flow works when we're moving from Bitcoin to Ethereum to large caps. Now we get to the exciting part, which is alt season. Alt season is defined as when we have the majority of non top 20 tokens outperforming them to a disgusting degree. It's actually really common in alt season to see coins pull 100%, 200%, 500%, or even a 1000% gain in a matter of a month. Alt season will do a couple of things. And I want to give you some tips that aren't necessarily shared on this chart. When we see alt season, most people are going to recognize it late. When you are looking at a real alt season, everyone's going to be talking about it. When you start to see your favorite influencers and YouTubers and X accounts talking about, wow, this market is so amazing. That's a hint that we're getting close to being done. And by the time you start to see coins moving up a lot, you're starting to go, wow, like I'm closing so many trades profitably and it's going up higher. Crap, I shouldn't have sold it. I'm going to buy some more. But by the time everyone's talking about alt season, that's a huge clue that we're basically out of juice. We're almost done with the move. The move is almost finished. So when you see this saturation of profits being shared, people are euphoric. Everyone's excited. They're making lots of money. That's kind of like that ding, 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 ding. You're probably near the top. Now we saw this as the filming of this video recently in March and April of 2024. We saw a really nice multi-month rally for altcoins specifically. Bitcoin led it first with the news of the ETF. Then it moved over to Ethereum because there were rumors that Ethereum might have its own ETF, which is yet as of the filming of this video is still delayed. But we saw Ethereum shoot up after Bitcoin did. Once Bitcoin and Ethereum moved up, then we saw a shift for large caps, which are that number three to number 20 spot. And then we saw lots of really small caps or at least low cap alts shoot up a lot higher. This happens really fast when you're trading in alt season, when you're finally seeing things are going up higher and higher and higher. One thing that really helps is to either buy into a position and set a take profit target really high, like higher than you think, and just leave it there or to sell a partial portion of your position, meaning that I'm not going to sell 100% of my position. I'm going to keep 5% or 10% and just kind of sit on it. I've done this multiple times and this works like a charm. Instead of me steadily accumulating trades and focusing on it over and over and over, I use bots to do this. And with a bot, it's automatically buying and selling in the background while I'm sleeping, working, while I'm actually filming this video. And I can use these bots to accumulate tokens, which I have been doing. I've been accumulating tokens actually in expectation of a massive alt season to come because I know that markets are cyclical. So I am well prepared for the next markets alt season to come because you want to start accumulating. The key to accumulation is that you don't want to risk your portfolio. I'm not just going to put in 100%, not even going to put in 50%. We talked about this. I'm going to put in just a little bit. And as I make my profits and I'm taking my profits back, I'm going to keep some of that profit in those coins, whatever, if it's a dog coin, a cat coin, a picture coin, it doesn't matter. But I want to keep a percentage of my position open. I'm going to leave some of those coins in my account because there is a good chance that prices can continue to go up way higher than most people think. Now that we understand that investing in altcoins is where we can make huge returns, we now have to pick which coins are going to win. And every year there is one winning narrative. From 2017 to 2018, the ICO boom fueled by the emergence of Ethereum and its ERC-20 token standard dominated the market. And that's why Ethereum itself saw massive growth rising from around $10 in early 2017 to an all-time high over $1,400 in January 2018. A 100 
140x increase. That's also when notable ICO projects like NEO, IOTA, and Cardano also experienced significant growth during this same period. And then in 2020, it was DeFi summer. Decentralized finance or DeFi took center stage in the summer of 2020 with projects claiming that they would disrupt traditional financial services. Tokens like PancakeSwap, Aave, and Uni saw impressive gains with some achieving 10 to 100x returns within months. Ethereum being the main layer one that many of these DeFi coins were built on also experienced massive growth from this. In 2021, Elon Musk tweeted about Dogecoin for the very first time. Meme coins led by Doge and Shiba Inu captured the attention of the crypto community and mainstream media. News articles were written about how high Doge could go. And whenever Elon tweeted about the dog, its price would increase. Doge rose from about half a cent on January 1st, 2021 to an all-time high of 73 cents on March 8th, 2021, which was a 132x increase. And from 2021 to 2022, non-fungible tokens or NFTs and the metaverse narrative gained significant traction. Projects like the Bored Ape Yacht Club or BAYC, CryptoPunks, and Decentraland or Mana attracted massive attention and investment. Bored Ape Yacht Club holders specifically were airdropped NFTs, which they would then sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Money was literally printed out of thin air for some of these holders. Bored Apes had a floor price of as high as 120 Ethereum when ETH was at a price of $3,000. Some NFT collections sold for millions of dollars. This picture of a rock sold for $1.3 million and Mana saw a 500x increase from its launch price. In 2021 to 2023, as Ethereum faced scalability issues, the focus shifted to layer 2 scaling solutions like Polygon or Matic, Optimism, and Arbitrum were said to be the future. These projects aim to improve transaction throughput and reduce fees on the Ethereum network. Matic, for instance, saw a 200x increase from its launch price. And this year, we're seeing the surge of AI coins like Render, Fetch AI, and Arkham because of AI becoming the dominant trend of the next decade. AI growth has also been fueled by NVIDIA becoming one of the biggest tech stocks and hitting an all-time high. Crypto, being a largely speculative market, is heavily influenced by the stories and trends that capture the imagination of investors and the wider public. When a particular narrative gains traction, whether it's the potential of a new technology, the endorsement of a prominent figure, or the promise of disrupting traditional systems, it can quickly turn into a massive increase in price of coins within the narrative. And once a narrative catches fire, everyone will start to predict what the next 100x coin is. Do not underestimate the power of narratives. You have to keep a close eye on where the attention and eyeballs are moving. But it's also equally important to exercise caution and thoroughly research any project before investing, as not every narrative-driven coin will deliver on its promises or sustain its growth in the long run. Principle six is money flows where narratives go. The seventh and last principle is arguably the most important, yet also the most overlooked. During the bull run, there will be a ton of influencers who are posting PLs on their YouTube and Twitter pages. They'll then try to attract people to a Telegram group where they give signals or a free Discord group where they'll share with you alpha that no one else is talking about. They'll keep sharing testimonials with you and share their predictions of what coins they think has the potential to pull 100x. And they're going to keep sharing coins until one of them does eventually hit a big win. And they'll use that as social proof that they're some sort of genius. When in reality, they have a whole host of coins that failed to take off, got rugged, and lost their following thousands of dollars. Take what they say with a grain of salt. Explain why you think people's predictions are often wrong, which brings me to one of the most infamous crypto influencers who consistently gets it wrong, Crypto Capo. Crypto Capo predicted in the 2020 bull run that Bitcoin would go past $100,000, which obviously didn't happen. And Everyone hated him for it. And once the bear market hit in 2022, he predicted that there would be a crash. So when the crash came, everyone called him a genius, which apparently went to his head. Since the one crash that he accurately predicted, he has been calling for Bitcoin to crash over and over again, even after Bitcoin made a new all-time high at 73K. The lesson here is to take influencer predictions with a grain of salt. Influencers might have ulterior motives of trying to sway your decisions 
or they might be trying to use you to pump their bags or give them exit liquidity, which is the very last principle. Be cautious of predictions as they're often wrong or adjusted. And those are the main principles for winning in crypto. The first principle is that history repeats itself. The crypto market moves in cycles with periods of euphoria followed by bear markets and eventual recovery. The second principle is to buy when there's blood in the streets. Be prepared to invest during market downturns when prices are low and sentiment is negative. The third principle is don't get emotionally attached to your coins. Have a clear strategy for entering and exiting positions and avoid letting emotions dictate your investment decisions. The fourth principle is to diversify your investments spread your investments across different cryptocurrencies, sectors, and traditional asset classes, as well as exchanges to mitigate risk. The fifth principle is not your keys, not your crypto. Maintain control over your private keys and be cautious when storing funds on centralized exchanges. The sixth principle is that money flows where narratives go. Pay attention to the dominant narratives and trends in the crypto space as they will affect your investment strategy. And finally, number seven, be cautious of predictions and take expert predictions with a grain of salt, as they may have ulterior motives or simply just be wrong. These are seven guiding principles that I've found to never fail me no matter what year it is or what part of the market cycle we're in. I have made hundreds of mistakes during my time investing and trading crypto. My hundreds of mistakes are now your shortcuts to success in the crypto markets. After making all of these mistakes, these are the exact steps I would take if I started over again in crypto as a complete complete beginner. The next step in getting started in crypto is picking an exchange. And there are lots of exchanges. Some of them are great. Some of them are so-so. And the best way to tell which exchange is actually worth depositing your funds onto is to find out which exchanges are talked about the most, which ones are reputable, and which ones actually have a good score. There's a site called CoinGecko. And in CoinGecko, you can actually see the trading volume of all crypto exchanges, whether it's the spot market, which is the normal market, or the futures or derivatives markets, which is going to have a lot more volume because it's futures trading. But here on CoinGecko, you'll be able to see which exchanges or rather which ones rank the highest in terms of volume. And that's what you want to pay attention to. And for the longest time, Binance and Coinbase have been at the top of that list. Coinbase is a great exchange. It's a great option for people specifically if you're in North America, if you're in America or Canada. And the reason for that is because Coinbase does support United States based citizens because the SEC has had a really hard and tough stance on crypto, specifically cryptocurrency exchanges, which is why I'm pointing you to Coinbase if you live in America or Canada. The other reason why Coinbase is a good pick is because Coinbase holds the majority of the custody for all of the recent Bitcoin ETFs, the spot ETFs, and all of the issuers like Grayscale, like Fidelity, like BlackRock, many of them use Coinbase as the holding place for the Bitcoin. So if BlackRock trusts Coinbase enough, to hold tens of thousands of Bitcoin, maybe even hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin on the Coinbase exchange, I think it's safe for most people. The one thing you have to know about Coinbase though is that they are known for having really high trading fees. And that's going to be something you'll see more and more as you start to go down the rabbit hole of investigating exchanges. But trading fees are a big part of it. As a trader, I make my money trading. But the exchange, part of their services is that you don't necessarily pay the exchange, but you pay them in fees. So there are maker and taker fees. Make Maker fees means that you're using or rather you're a market maker. And by being a market maker, you're someone who's using limit orders, but a market taker. So there's maker fees and taker fees. The taker fees are market based orders, meaning that your order is being pushed to the top of the order book. So that way you can get filled as soon as possible. There are benefits to using both. But when it comes to fees, it always pays to be a market maker because market maker fees are always going to be cheaper compared to market taker fees. So it's more expensive in terms of trading fees to place market market orders compared to limit orders. There are more details when it comes down to this. Coinbase has the highest trading fees, but depending on the trading volume and rather your account size, they actually have a program where you pay, I think, 40 or 50 US dollars per month and you get zero fees. This makes sense for some. It doesn't make sense for others. I'm going to leave a link down below in the description to help you understand if this is going to be a good fit for you. Now, the other exchange that would be really worth your while to get access to is Binance.com. If you're outside of the United States, you actually have it the best. You really do. Because people that are in, in North America, it's not so easy being a crypto trader. Coinbase, I can recommend 
recommend to U.S. based citizens. Binance, I can recommend to non-U.S. based citizens, but not everybody has access to Binance.com. Another good exchange to check out would be KuCoin. I like to use KuCoin mainly for AB trading. AB trading is a specific style of trading that I talk about in my videos and playlists here on YouTube. But just to quickly explain what it is, AB trading stands for account building trading. And account building trading is all about making these big repeated moves on low volume charts with really big spreads, basically making 10% multiple times in a day on a chart that only sees about 500 to a thousand dollars trading volume, maybe in a 12 hour period, maybe in a 24 hour, that would be really low. But charts like this exist on KuCoin. So we can actually trade these charts to grow a small account into a big one, which is what AB trading is all about. So I do like KuCoin for AB trading. You can find charts with more volume there, but admittedly it's a lower volume exchange and there runs a risk when you're on low volume exchanges. The risk is not just the illiquidity of the order book, meaning that you don't have as much volume in the order book, not as many orders taking place. It's not moving as quickly, but low volume exchanges tend to make quick decisions on the charts that are on that exchange. They can decide to delist a ticker. Now this happens on Coinbase. It'll happen on Binance and other big exchanges too. But on smaller exchanges with lower liquidity, they're going to pull those tickers real fast. I actually have a an alert system set up in the Better Traders Club, but we have alerts for new listings and for delisting events for exchanges. So that way we're aware of things that are happening happening and usually they give you like a week or so but usually a delisting event is not a very fun event other good exchanges to check out would be kraken they're also a u.s based exchange and they serve a lot of u.s clients they've been around for a long time and if you're looking to do some leverage trading on a derivatives market buy bet i like these exchanges because they plug in to my trading platform i personally do not trade directly on exchanges the reason for that is because exchanges aren't meant for trading not at least to me and i've been doing this for a long time since 20 2018 on crypto and in stocks 2015. So back in 2015, when I started with stock trading, I was using Thinkorswim and I was able to put in my limit orders for buying and selling. That was about it. That's basically the same thing as what you get when you log into an exchange and you want to trade on it. It's kind of okay, but it's not really beneficial to you as a trader. When I moved to crypto, I heard about third party trading platforms and a third party trading platform gives you access to all of your exchanges. You basically connect them to one hub and from that one hub, you can execute trades on multiple exchanges, either simultaneously or individually or independently, rather. It's a great tool. Plus, on a third-party trading platform, you can also run bots. Bot trading is one of the best things that you could possibly take advantage of, especially if you're busy, if you have a job uh, that requires a lot of attention, or you're working late hours, long hours, you're studying, you have a family, you travel a lot. Bots are great because they do all of the buying and the selling for you in the background. By doing this, you can actually accumulate coins that you're really interested in to hold for the long term. Another reason why I don't like logging in directly to an exchange is safety. While this has never happened to me before, I do know that people have been phished before and it's not F-I-S-H, it's P-H-I-S-H, not the band, but phishing as in like a scam. And basically what happens is people don't bookmark the exchanges that they use all the time. They go to the wrong exchange, which looks right, or they click on a suspicious link and they decide, oh, that's the same Binance or same Coinbase where it's really not. It's just looks like it is. And when you plug in your username and your password, you just gave the hacker your username and password, and they're going to liquidate your account. I don't like logging into exchanges unless I have to make withdrawals or unless I have to make transfers. The other benefit that I really like about using a third-party trading platform is the fact that it's safer. Not all third-party trading platforms are the same. There are many that I talk about on my channel. There's three commas, there's Pinex, and there's all trading. Three commas did have a an API incident a couple years ago where the API key that were connected to the exchange, rather for the exchange to three commas, it was compromised and it costs a lot of people a lot of money. There is a little bit of a bad taste in people's mouths for that experience with three commas. And I understand it and I get it. And even in our courses, we still talk about three commas because I still believe it's actually one of the best trading platforms available. It's just regrettable that this event happened. There's another option, which is Pionex. Pionex is an exchange, but it's heavily dependent on the volume generated by Binance. When you sign up to Pionex, there are no costs at all. There are no subscription fees. Whereas with three commas or all trading, there are subscription fees. So one nice thing that 
people like about Pinex is that you don't have to pay a monthly fee and you can trade and you can use bots do all that kind of fun stuff. There's a Pinex US, there's a United States based version and there's .com for everyone else. But the trading fees are trading fees. And if you have an account that's over $50,000 or more, you're going to get a better cost performance, better price performance, better banging for your buck if you use a tool like three commas or all trading. Why? Because if you're using $50,000 per position and they're charging you like 0.1%, that's going to add up to be a lot of money. Let's say you have a position of $10,000. 1% of that is going to be $100. 0.1% is going to be $10. And then 0.05%, which I think is what the trading fee is, is about five bucks. Now that five bucks doesn't sound like a lot, but if you make repeated trades over and over and over, let's say you made a hundred trades in a month. Well, that was just $500 in trading fees. Maybe you made some money, which is great, but maybe you also didn't on some trades. So in my mind, it makes way more sense to take that 500 bucks and buy an annual subscription to a third party trading platform. But again, it depends on your account size. And now we're going to be talking about all trading. All trading is a trading platform that is not very well known in most of the big circles. Most people know about three commas or trade Santa or crypto hopper, but all trading is a sleeper. Well, I think it's a good trading platform is because it excels at active trading tools. I've been using this account and it's helped me to grow my account to a ridiculous degree. There are things that I don't like about it. There are things that I wish would be different, but as far as safety goes, as far as functionality and performance, all trading is actually one of the best trading platforms available. One reason why I like all trading is that they have a five word password. So if you've ever used a wallet, a cold wallet, hot wallet, and you need to restore your wallet because you get a new device and you want to log in, you have to come up with your seed phrase. All trading has something similar called a trading password. So if I log into all trading on someone else's computer or someone gets my password and my email address and they try to log in, they won't be able to because they don't have my trading password. Only I have that. The other thing that I really like about them, they do use two factor authentication, which is one way to strengthen and prevent hackers from getting access to your exchange. Things just keep getting stepped up on all trading. The security is fantastic and security is everything. We've seen lots of exchanges get hacked. We've seen lots of unfortunate fumbles when it comes to trading platforms. So when I look at all trading as far as a complete trading platform, I like it a lot. One of the parts that I don't like as much is their bot trading. Now, I really like three commas and I especially love their DCA bots because they're just so darn easy to use. They're really cool. Lots of functionality. You can do a ton of stuff with it. With all trading, it's a little bit more difficult. And I'm not going to be setting up a bot in this video, but if you're someone that's really into the idea of active trading, scalping, swing trading, AB trading, if that's something that sounds interesting to you, all trading is a really, really good idea. I'm already logged in here to all trading. You're going to see a lot of stuff. This is your balance, how it's changed over time, your open positions, how those are looking. You can take action on any of these at any time. Down here, we can see that these are some recently closed positions that have done fairly well. So looking at all green, this is a good time to film this video because it's not always all green. And over here, we just have a quick review of the one day change and the seven day change for all these coins that are here, which is great. Plus there are bots and we can see how are the bots doing. And this is normal for bot trading to see unrealized profit of negative $500. That doesn't really phase me because this is bot trading in a nutshell. This is how it works. Not really worried about it. I'm just waiting on these positions to close. That's how I run. That's how I roll. So in the settings here, the part that's really cool is right here. It says exchange account API keys. You'll see a couple of things that are triggered or like enabled right there. When you create an account on all trading. And I have a link to sign up down below in the description of this video, by the way. So please do click that link. When you sign up for all trading and you want to connect an exchange to all trading, what you have to do is you need to connect an account and then enter in your five word password. Then you get to choose from a selection of different exchanges, which one you're going to connect. And then they walk you through how to connect it. So let me just quickly talk about API keys and what this all means. An API key simply stands for application program interface, but essentially when an API key means means is that you're giving access from one app to another app. In this case of a crypto exchange, we're creating an API key that gives all trading permission to access your balance, to view your funds, to trade on your behalf, but not to withdraw. They're very clear on that. You don't want to enable that button to withdraw funds. But in order to connect Binance, Bybit, Coinbase, KuCoin, all these exchanges to all trading, you need to make an API. Once you've done that, then you can connect it to all trading. And then like you can see, 
see here on my screen, I have a couple of exchanges that are connected here. Again, not all of them, but these are the ones that I have connected, which is great. So this way I can choose to enable or disable them, which means that I'm able to trade on these exchanges, which is fantastic, which is what I want to be doing. The other fun thing that we can do here is here in devices. Again, another safety thing that I just love about this app, I can see which instances are logged into all trading. Inevitably, you're going to be using a trading platform on multiple devices. So now I just have it on my iPhone, which they do have an iPhone or iOS app and an Android app and here on this PC. There's a lot of other fun stuff we can do, but let's just get to the fun stuff where the trading terminal is. On the trading terminal, this can look admittedly overwhelming at first, but to make things super simple, we have a trading window here that shows us the chart and here in the chart, we can view past trades. So this yellow arrow right here is a buy and this red arrow is a sell. These are happening over and over and over. This is the chart for ICP on KuCoin. And this is a bot that I started back at the end of March with the sole purpose of accumulating ICP. So every single trade that you see here, it's actually not me trading this chart at all. And you can even see that I have orders right here. So we can see that here's my break even price at about 1250. You can see right here, it says TP1. That's my take profit target. I've already placed my trade right there and it's just waiting for the price to move up a bit more. This is great. All I have to do is just turn it on and let it run, which is really cool. And you can also see that I have orders right here to buy. I have an order right here. Is that actually a perfect level in case there's a pullback on ICP. If it falls down another 5%, then it's going to fill this buy order and then it's going to average down, which is what DCA trading is all about. And then when the price snaps back, it's going to close with more profit. Down here in my positions, you can see all the different trades and how they're running. So I'm not going to go through all of them because some of them are actually pretty red. And it's a little embarrassing to be honest, but it's normal. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that in this little tab that says recovered, I'm actually going to come over here to look at ERN, BTC, and actually want to open this up in a new tab. Again, something I really like about using this. So you'll see here with ERN, I've actually been trading this over and over. I've been taking profit and just moving down my entry over and over and over and over. And this trade right here, this position has been open since the 9th of May. So I just kept trading, I kept trading, it fell down. I have an order right here to buy in case the price falls lower. It hasn't. And you can see that I have an order right here to sell, even though this position is technically not in profit. I've traded this so many times and I've averaged it down. What's going to be great is when this price rebounds and I get closed out in profit, then I move on and I keep trading. One really cool thing I like about this is that we can see here in this position info area, which I can adjust all these windows. It gives me a whole lot of information. It lets me know that this is a bot. It tells me how much I invested, how much I recovered, how much is unrealized. It's a great system for managing your trades, managing your positions, and just knowing what's going on. There's a lot of other widgets that you can use. You can leave notes for yourself. You can check up on news. I can check the order book and I can also scan the markets to see which coins are really popping right now. At the moment, Bohm is pumping. So I can come over here to this chart for Bohm and I can see I actually bought Bohm a while ago and I'm just kind of sitting on a position. This helps me to see, okay, where did I buy in? Bought in way back here. I didn't sell. I know. I know. It's okay though. Long-term conviction. I love this fact though, because it helps me to keep track of my open position. Positions. I can see when I bought Bohm and even though it went in the red a couple of times and it went up and it went down and went up, holding on to position like this is great because then I can keep track. Okay, what's my cost basis? How much in the green am I on this position of Bohm? And then when it goes up even higher, I can kick myself even more to say, gosh, why didn't I buy more Bohm when it was down here under one cent? So let's find a chart to trade. We're going to come over here and let's see. We're going to find out which ones are going crazy. So let's find one CTA. This one just listed incredibly risky. So we're going to look at the five minute time frame. so we can see a couple of things here. We're going to go ahead and look at the order book. So the order book shows us, like we talked about before, the spread. So we can see all the buy orders that are here. We can see all the sell orders and where there might be some friction for placing a trade on this. Now, if I don't want to see the order book, again, I can go over here and just say, no, goodbye. And I usually don't use the order book, to be honest. So if I want to place a trade, one thing that I really like about using all 
all trading is the idea that I can actually use a preset. You can see this little shiny button over here. So they have all these different presets that you can create. And I really like this intraday one that I use actually a whole lot. And the whole idea of this intraday is that I'm just scalping. I'm looking to take profit at 3% and 5%. And it's already filled telling me, or rather it's set up so that I'm using 10% of my account or rather my available balance right here of $717. So you can see it's 7174, something like that. So I want to use that much for the trade, but I want to use DCA. So I have my order right here and I'm using a ladder order, which is really, really cool. So I have my order to buy, but in case the price falls lower, right about there, 15%. Again, this is pre-filled and it's already done for me, which is really cool. Then when the price falls down, I already have a DCA order there. And of course I can adjust this. I don't have to keep this exact price. I might want to move it down a little bit lower because I want to take advantage of any panic that might be in this chart. But let's go ahead and let's see. You know, I think this is actually going to have a little bit of a pullback and we'll see if we can make a trade. So all I have to do is hit confirm. That's it. One of the reasons why I like this so much is that I don't have to spend a lot of time going, okay, I'm going to use this much and put this order here. And using the preset sets makes this super duper fast, which is awesome. And if I decide, you know what, I need to fix something. I actually want to fix this and I want to reduce this. I can, I can just change it and drag it directly on the chart, which is really cool. Even all this entry stuff, I can change all the numbers, even with an active order. I can even say, I want to keep my funds free. So if the price goes above the previous high, it's just going to cancel out my position and it's going to take back my funds. It's going to take away this buy order. So if I miss the train, I miss the train. It's fine. I'm not going to have this here. So in case this happens to shoot up 300% and then crashes down, I forget, oh no, I had this order waiting right here to buy CTA at 37 cents, crap, and then it just falls. It doesn't matter. That's the whole benefit of this is that I can place these orders and go, well, if it gets filled, then this is great. And if it gets filled, it's going to remove that blue trigger right there, which is awesome. Let's talk a little bit about the bots and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I just want to help you understand how this works. These bots are generating profit quietly in the background. Background. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes they're just kind of sitting there and doing nothing for weeks, sometimes months. Interfere. You can aggressively get into a position. You can adjust things just like I showed you on the chart. But bots are a really great way that you can do this effectively. You can also create grid bots and use them here on all trading. Their grid bots are very interesting. But in this current market, which is very bullish, I really like using the DCA bots to accumulate tokens. Another really cool benefit about using all trading is that they have a built in market explorer. So you don't actually have to leave the app to go to CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap to find out what's happening. You can actually just stay here. They have categories just like on CoinMarketCap. So I can explore different dog themed meme coins or Solana meme coins and figure out well which ones are doing really well. And then I can click here and I can find out which exchanges are these being traded on. And I can see if I have access to these exchanges, which is great. Then I can just go ahead and trade these coins, which is awesome. Another benefit of doing this is that when I'm doing some research or checking out to see how things go, like, I don't have to leave the app. It's really great. Plus, I can also find out which coins have had a very, very happy last 24 hours. I can find coins that have pumped, find coins that have just recently dumped super hard. Stuff like this is really, really beneficial to me when I'm doing research and looking for coins, but the categories really nail it for me. This is the part where I can see a lot of promise for a lot of you that are just kind of wondering, well, what do I look at? What kind of coins right now have the most dominance right now, which would be layer one. This is dominating a lot. F FTX holding smart contracts, but let's play a little bit more risky. Let's look for things that are combined market cap. So we can look at all these things and find coins that are in the internet computer system. So we have a couple of these that are indexes, DGEN, JPEG, Cook, Kai. If there was some narrative that was really hot, like DeFi index or DPIN, maybe I want to look at some of these coins that are part of DPIN or decentralized physical infrastructure networks, but I can use this to figure out, okay, which coins are really dumping and which coins are really pumping and I can figure out, okay, are these available on the exchanges that I'm using or just using the seven day chart right here? I can see, okay, these ones actually would be good for trading. I want to find out more about these. Doing research is really easy on all trading. Again, it's basically the same thing because they're importing all the data from CoinGecko or probably using another service, but you don't have to leave the app to do it. And you can do this as well on your mobile device. I want to go back to this chart, ICP. Not that I'm chilling internet computer at all. It's just a chart that I've been using a DCA bot on, but I 
want to talk about this. One really cool thing that I mentioned before about DCA bot trading is the ability for this to run by itself. You don't need human interaction for bot trading, which is great. But the thing that I really like about this all trading is that you can choose to take profit in the coin itself. You can do this as well with three commas, choosing to take profit in the base currency or the quote currency. And there are different times in the market that you want to do either one. If it's bullish, take profit in the base. Bearish, take profit in the quote. That's gold right there. You actually could grow your portfolio with that little sense that I just said, but stick with me. There's even more to it. DCA bots like available, like the ones that are available rather on all trading are great because you can choose to take a small percentage in the coin itself. If you've ever wanted to accumulate coins without risking your entire portfolio, DCA bots. If you've ever wanted to buy into a token, but you're not sure if it's ever going to hit your price and you feel like you don't know when to enter, DCA bots. If you've ever had a position open and you're feeling really proud of yourself only to see the price go right back down and you never took profit, DCA bots. The whole reason why DCA bots are great are not because they only use DCA strategy, but they run in an automated fashion. So that way they make the decisions you don't have to. This isn't like some AI solution. This is more of a mathematical, logically based solution, which is good. Having fixed take profit levels, having fixed DCA levels to buy more as the price falls. This is actually a really good way to trade. Look at this chart again for ICP. You can see here, even though the price fell down a whole lot back here, when I bought at about $18, the price fell six, seven, eight percent When it bought up here at $17 and 98 cents, it's actually a really bad place to buy. But you know what? The funny thing is that even though this is a terrible place to buy, and even though I missed out on buying more at a lower price, it's still closed in profit right there 12 days later. If you are a traditional trader, if you are just using your phone on an exchange and all of a sudden the chart that you're in not only drops 5%, it drops 17, it drops down, you know, 40%. Most of you are going to sell there, you're going to sell there, or you're going to sell there. That's how it works in crypto. Because these markets are so emotionally driven, it's so easy to give into the fear and sell at the bottom. Another reason why I love DCA bots is that I just trust the strategy. This one, admittedly, I should have bought more down here, but I just didn't. I let the strategy play out. I let the bot play out and look, it closed in profit and it started up again. And then I bought some more and it took profit again on the bounce where most of you probably would wouldn't sell. Most of you wouldn't buy as it's falling. Definitely wouldn't buy down here because you're thinking, well, it's going to go down here again. Well, guess what? The bots win every time. This is why I love DCA bot trading. It buys here on the top. Most wouldn't buy there. Buys more, averages down the take profit price, and it closes in profit. And look, here I am. I got one, two, three, boom. So it sold on the bounce just a couple of hours ago at four in the morning. You can see it down there because this is a trading view interface right here. That red four in the morning. Since the end of March, I've been accumulating I ICP because I personally think that ICP is going to be worth a whole lot more at the top of the bull market. I'm using a bot to accumulate safely and I'm looking at, okay, where do I want to buy this chart? I think I'll buy some here. Oh gosh, it falls down that far. Okay. Maybe I was lucky enough to get some here at $10, but after having a massive rally up 50%, then it falls back down. I would feel pretty dumb by not selling anything after that big rally. And now it's up a little bit. Maybe I might sell some, but it was already up here and it went all the way up there before. I mean, it should go a lot higher, right? It takes the guessing out. I can safely accumulate on the site without even thinking about it, without having to check in on it. It's just running. Can I adjust things? Sure. I can adjust my take profit target. I can move it way up high. I could even divide my sell into multiple orders. But the thing I'm trying to tell you is that using a DCA bot is one of the easiest and best decisions I've ever made when it comes to accumulation. It's great. So when you're looking to accumulate coins for the long term, DCA bots, easy. If you're struggling with emotional interference, which we're going to talk about later, DCA bots. If you're struggling with selling on a bounce, DCA bots. If you're struggling buying on a dip, DCA bots. I'm going to give you the best advice ever. You can look on YouTube. No one says this. And there's a reason why. Most of the people that are making courses like this, or they have crypto YouTube channels, they don't know when to take profits and they don't know what to do with them. Bookmark this, take a screenshot. Listen to me. At the end of every month, take a percentage of your profits and buy some Bitcoin, buy some coins that you really like. But every single month, tally up your profit and loss and take your funds, your profits, take a percentage of that, not the whole thing, but a percentage, buy some Bitcoin, put it in an offline wallet. I've been doing this since about 2019 and it's been amazing. 
I have been able to consistently grow a wallet of mine, an offline cold wallet, very well. And the best part about this is that it's off an exchange, which means I'm not going to touch it. And I'm accumulating Bitcoin on the site. Even though the price of Bitcoin is going to fluctuate, I'm accumulating for the long term. So how do you do this? You can get some sort of hot wallet app, meaning like Coinbase wallet, Trust wallet. There are lots of different wallets, even um, alternative layer ones like Solana has their own wallet, Phantom. There are lots of different options, but it's really better to have something like this, which is a cold wallet. This is my Ledger Nano X. Now I want to talk to you just a little bit about taking profits. When you tally up your profits, take a percentage out, put it into preferably a cold wallet. These are kind of expensive. I think they range between $200 and $300. It's worth the investment. The difference between this and a smartphone is that your smartphone is always connected to the internet. And the risk that you run with something like that is if your smartphone gets compromised for any reason, and again, God forbid that happened to you, but if it does, then that means that your wallet could be compromised too. This doesn't actually store my Bitcoin, but this is the only way it can be moved. When I have a cold wallet like this, the only way that I can make a transaction that move my Bitcoin, because Bitcoin never ever leaves the blockchain, or rather my wallet, which is connected to the blockchain. It's not stored here. No crypto is ever stored on this, but this gives me the permission to move the funds. So one day when Bitcoin's at a million dollars and I want to sell all the Bitcoins that I've accumulated, I'm going to use this to approve a transaction to send my Bitcoin from the blockchain to an exchange. So that way I can sell it for fiat. If someone were to compromise my computer, that would be very unfortunate, but they won't have access to my Bitcoin. If my house burned down, it'd be really, really, really bad. What happens to this? Well, this is unfortunately not fireproof, but it comes with a secret wallet phrase. So if something were to happen to this, I still have this 12 words that create this seed phrase. And this seed phrase is extremely valuable. So understand that for one, take your profits, buy some Bitcoin, get an offline wallet, put your funds there. And two, just invest in one. It's worth it, especially if you're going to play in a crypto game for a while. It might take some time for the Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency that you're accumulating to actually be worth something that you really want to sell. You'd be really happy to sell for like a 5x, 10x, 20x but patience pays. The next crucial part about winning in crypto is technical analysis. Your ability to use technical analysis in order to make good trading decisions and inevitably make money in any market will determine your success. Not knowing how to do technical analysis properly is the main reason why you're losing money or your portfolio isn't growing. Technical analysis is important in choosing which coins you want to invest in for the short and medium term, but will also tell you what coins that you should trade. There are tons of different technical analysis patterns, different formations. I am literally going to give you the need to know stuff so that way you can start using it right away. Everything else is great, especially for traditional markets, but crypto is not a traditional market at all. If you look at the market cap of cryptocurrency, the total crypto market cap is a fraction of the bond market, a fraction of the foreign exchange markets, fraction of the New York Stock Exchange's trading volume. Crypto is a drop in the bucket. If we know that, then the only trading patterns we need to pay attention to are really support and resistance lines. There are tons of different cheat sheets and different patterns and all this stuff, and they are useful in traditional markets. But remember that crypto is not traditional. It's very emotionally driven. It's FOMO driven. It's also very erratic. It's prone to pump and dumps all the time. I know that some of you are expecting this deep dive into chart patterns. But the reality is that the only charts that really respect that are Bitcoin and Bitcoin. Most everything else like Doge, Sol, like no other charts are really going to be obeying the outcome of a Wyckoff pattern or an inverted head and shoulders. Bitcoin is the only one that I've ever seen really do that. If we think about the ranking of all the coins from the top number one to 10, those coins, excluding the stable coins, which shouldn't be there, but those top 10 tokens can respect traditional TA when it comes to the advanced patterns like ascending wedges, descending wedges, pennant patterns. Bitcoin is the only one that really does because you'll see them disrespected many times. Sometimes it'll work, but I want to give you the goods and help you to focus in on what really works on crypto. And this is my experience of doing this for a long time. So crypto is not the same as Forex, as the bond market, as the stock market. It's not the same. Let's go ahead and just start on some simple support and resistance levels. Support and resistance is super duper simple to 
to draw. And here on Trading View, we're looking at BTC USD on Bitstamp, so Bitcoin against the dollar. I like this chart a lot because it goes back super duper far. This is our trend line right here. You can also just hit Alt T, which I do all the time. It's way faster than clicking on that. Now, there are lots of variations of that too. There are rays, there are info lines, trend angles, all this stuff. I don't really use them. You can see up here in my floating favorites bar that I do sometimes use a parallel channel, but honestly, I'll just draw this. It's a lot easier. Most of this stuff is just for charting and things like that, helping people understand what I'm seeing and sharing those ideas. But when I'm charting, I'm pretty much just using support and resistance levels all the time. So let's draw one real quick. The first thing you need to know is that we want these to be as exact as possible. Doing a support and resistance line like this isn't so helpful. And the reason why is because if you look over here, this first candle, we put our start of this resistance level not at the extreme high. So what is the high? It's definitely not over here. It's the highest point that the price moves before falling down. And we know it's the high because we don't make a new high. So what do we do? Well, we don't choose to put this line anywhere. What we want to do is we want to identify the next high before the price falls lower. So now we have a resistance line. I'm going to give you a little bit of a tip. A resistance or a support fan is basically using our pivots. I'm going to draw resistance to the next high level like that. So it kind of fans out and we would continue to repeat this process if we make a new high like this. So this is essentially our fan is this shape right here. This is helpful to do because when resistance is broken, which happened right here, it actually fell down. It was actually a fake out, but finally we have a breakout right over here. Once this breakout happens, again, I'm giving you the goods. We want to count three days or rather three candles after breaking this resistance level. So we've done that one, two, three, good, boom, it's broken. So then I just make it dashed because you'll be surprised to see how many times these historical support and resistance levels come back up. If I were to draw one from this high to this peak right here, you'll see this candle that happened yesterday pumped right into it and it's kind of having a pullback. Now there are other reasons why that's happening. We'll get to that in a second, but it's useful to use these historical lines. You can do the same thing when it comes to support levels. And let's do that with the chart for Ethereum. We're going to zoom out and we're going to come down over here. For support, we want to find the lowest possible value for a chart. We're going to use our hotkey, which is Alt T. So that way we can do this trend line. I'm going to press down my control key on my Windows or on the Mac. It's the Apple key. And then we're going to draw a line from the lowest low to the next lowest low to help us establish our support. So that's that right there. And I'm going to make this solid because this level hasn't been hit yeah, there it is right there. So check this out. This is what I'm telling you guys. This is why crypto is different. So support was tested here. This is a test right there. And we have the wick, even though it doesn't touch, that's a test and a pierce. Every single time this is tested right here, this is a considered a test, even though it doesn't touch, that's definitely a pierce. There it is again. The more pierces and tests we have on a chart, the weaker that line becomes so that eventually the price breaks down. Once it breaks, it's broken and we're confirming it after one, two, three days. But lo and behold, Thanks to that Coin Telegraph intern, the price of Bitcoin shot up a lot, which meant that Ethereum also followed. So even though this line of support actually was invalidated right here, it was no longer support, but it broke back above. We're going to call it good. We can decide to keep this, which I will. So this way I have two levels here. I'm going to now take my low right here and draw a line of support. I'm going to make this a little bit darker because I want to show you my fan that's in progress right here. So we have this level to this level right here. Now that means that we have support approximately at 2337. I don't think we're going to see that price fall down that far. So this is a possibility. Another possibility would be to draw from this low here to this one to give us a line of support. If I were doing this on a chart, that's probably what I would do. I also want to point out that this chart is not the same as this chart, which is not the same as this chart, which is not the same as this chart. There are many different trading pairs across multiple exchanges, and each of them have a slightly different reaction in price. For instance, here on the chart for Kraken, you can see that there are these massive, what this is called a fat finger right there, that long lower wick. Right here, this fat finger went all the way down to 2537, whereas if we go to Coinbase, we never saw that low at all. So that means on Coinbase, we can actually take this and we're going to get different values with it. We can do our support fan and look, the support fan actually got broken right there. What happens now after support is broken 
screen. Usually there's some sort of a test to see, is this going to be respected? This is the test. How many days was it above? Well, we have one, two, bump, fell below. So it's respected. So this is was broken and now it's respected. So we're going to keep it solid. So what happens next is this. Eventually the price of Ethereum is going to try to move up higher and more often than not, it's going to find some resistance at this level right there. The further down we go the list, if we go to a chart like Jupe, we're likely not going to see support and resistance respected as much and it does depend on the exchange. So let's find an exchange with a bit more volume. We're going to do our support fan all over the place. We're going to find our next low to see how does it hold up. Uh, there we go. So look at this, not a perfect example because it doesn't touch, but I would technically call this a bounce. So it's actually holding up. Now let's do the top side. Let's do our resistance. So here you can see the price is trying to break above resistance and finally it does. It stays above the resistance. So what happens now? Now we just keep moving it out and we keep moving it out. We get another break right there and we want to wait a couple of days for that to actually be verified or to be confirmed. So we need to wait three more candles on the daily time frame. This is actually pretty good. And for those that are curious, is, yes, this is actually a pennant formation, which is technically very bullish. So I know I said pennant formations don't typically work, but in this case, it's actually working out, which is great. And a pennant simply means that we have a triangular shaped line like this right here, and it's making this triangle. So what we want to see is that if we're coming from the downside like this, which we are, the expectation is to break out above resistance to go up even higher. Now that's not always going to be the case, but this pennant actually happens to work out well. So there are two types of support and resistance levels. There are these diagonal support or resistance levels, depending on what the chart's doing. And then there are price-based support and resistance levels. So let's go to a different chart. Let's choose a meme coin for fun. Let's choose Pepe. Pepe is looking good. You can see I already have some stuff here on the chart. I'm going to go ahead and hide this for now because I don't want to confuse you too much. But I want to go back in history for this chart. We can see when this listed on this exchange, BitGet, and we have our low right here. I'm going to press Alt-H, and that's going to place a line here that happens to be yellow because I just like it to pop against the black, but this is a horizontal line. I can come over here and choose horizontal line right there, Alt H. The difference between a line an array is that array has a start point and it keeps going to the right. What I want to do is I want to highlight a couple of things. So we have long standing support there and you see this high right there. That right there is our high. You guessed it. Good job. Because we have this high here. Now this is a level of resistance. Once we see the price respect or rather right there, once you see it fall down and again, it's going to matter exchange to exchange. But right here, we have a mini recreation of the chart of Bitcoin for the 2018, 2000 2019 year. I am not kidding. This is actually what Bitcoin did. It shot up, made a high at 20K, came down to about 6K, bounced back up to about 12K, danced on 6K, hit support. Everyone thought it would hold at 6K, broke to 3K, and then finally shot way back up. And now you know the rest of the story. This level of support was pierced right here. Same concept as the diagonal lines that I showed you before. Pierce, pierce. Every single time a line of support is not respected, meaning that the price does not bounce off of it, but it hits it, it's weakened. When this support level is broken, the price comes down. And now this flips from support to resistance. Resistance is when the price is trying to break above something. Support is trying to hold or support the price. So resistance means that it can't go up that high, but it can. So even though it's historical, even though it was broken, supported right there, pierced. What does it mean when we see a chart that's pierced right here? It means it's a sign of weakness. So if you're in a position right here and you see a big pierce like that, we don't want to sell down here. We want to wait for a little bit of a bounce, but we want to get out of something like that because chances are it's going to break and break it does. It actually breaks a lot lower. So we have this level of support and guess what happens down here? The price wicks into it, which means it's weakening. It comes down and it flips. See that flip right there? So it breaks support. So now it's resistance, resistance, resistance falls lower. So we just do another level like that. And look at that right there. What happens? The price shoots up, tries to hit resistance. Can't do it, can it? That's how it works. The price is going to come back down. It respects support. And then we see it rocket up higher. It breaks through resistance, breaks through resistance. And now we have this level up here. Funny, when we look at where it stopped, do you notice something interesting about this? Because I do. You're going to see this happen a lot. Eventually, the price does break out and it goes up a whole lot higher. It goes up so high that it actually goes up above the previous high. And this 
this is where we call price exploration. This is fun. And it's also scary because the price could go up a lot higher. It happened to go up 139% higher over 11 days, 141%. We found support, weakened it, but it respected it. And now it's up higher again. So now that we've done this, we just keep identifying the extreme levels. So that way we can plot these levels of support and resistance because this is how it's done. Now, this is my favorite part. We're going to be talking about indicators. Indicators are a godsend. Honestly, I know some people out there don't like to indicators. They like naked charts. Only give me the naked charts. Only show me support and resistance. But the truth is that they're missing out because there's so many things that are happening with price action that are generating signals and things that are letting us know as traders, oof, there's something happening actually under the chart here. We can't actually see it on the price action, but there's something bubbling to the surface. Or if you're not sure how to enter a chart, where to enter, where support and resistance might be, indicators are great for that. Let's go ahead and dive into some often used indicators that I use. First is RSI. Just ignore this one right here for now, okay? RSI is one of the best and most reliable indicators out there. I have a resource called Signals. It's this PDF right here. It's probably out of print. Incredibly useful resource because this group of traders decided the same, you know, they decided to answer that question. Which indicator is the best? There are so many. Bollinger Bands, there's Moving Averages, there's RSI, Commodity Channel Index, Moving, MACD, Stochastic RSI. When I started learning how to trade, I looked in and explored all of them and figured out, okay, which ones actually work? Which ones can I actually use? And not many of them were that useful, except for RSI. Here on this chart, RSI is simple. RSI tells us when charts are oversold and when they are overbought. My RSI has these levels at 70 and 25 for reasons that I can't go into into this video. If you want to know why and how to trade with insane accuracy with RSI, you have to take the Smarter Trader course on the bettertraders.com. But just to give you the simple scoop on RSI, the whole purpose of this indicator is to tell you when charts are overbought, when they're oversold. Now, just because a chart is right here above red is overbought does not mean you sell. All it means is that the chart is overbought. So be careful, fellas, because it should be heading down. Now, check this out. From this point right here, when RSI was at 77, like it says right there, the price of Solana actually increased 9% and it actually went up even higher. As RSI fell, of course, this fell a little bit. It fell about 9% only to continue raging higher and higher and higher and higher. Solana continued to move up another 92% from this point. Just because it's overbought does not mean you sell. Vice versa versa just because it's oversold does not mean you buy. There are some periods and points in the chart where it does make the most sense to buy. Ideally, when we have very, very, very oversold values like this one where RSI was down to 15 on the daily time frame. And I say that with emphasis because if you look at the chart, when the last couple of times that Solana was incredibly oversold, it was at $14. Here, it was at $8. When we're in a bear market, we're going to see this happen a whole lot. After we top out in the next bull market, we're going to see RSI go down to some crazy oversold levels. But if we're in a bear market, buying here at $90 would be painful. Not only will you feel like a genius for about maybe two months, four months, you're going to feel like an idiot once it falls another 90%. And it's going to take you almost two years to become profitable again. Just because it's oversold does not mean you buy. You have to know when to use this. There are extreme levels to pay attention to. I'm going to give you another tip on the weekly time frame. When you see RSI was overbought, here. And I'm using Alt V, by the way, to draw that vertical line. It also puts a date right there, which is really helpful. So this level, when it was at 72 on the weekly time frame, it closed at 28 it then proceeded to shoot up 600%. Just because it's overbought does not mean you sell. Here's the secret. On the weekly time frame for crypto, when you see charts going into overbought territory, that means you can ride that train for quite a while. When it's super oversold right here, it's typically a good entry, but tread lightly. RSI is great, but it's not helping us out very much in terms of the trend. While we can find these great entries that do work well, like here, yeah, we can make 50%. That's great. But it also means that we drop down 75%. We chop sideways forever. We're going to feel like idiots until October 2023. That's too long to wait. We need something that's going to help us to gauge the trend. Trend trading is one of the best ways to make a ton of money. Scalping is great. AB trading is good. 
Do you see a bots and accumulation is good? Trend trading is how you make your money. I'm going to show you the exact reason why. We're going to go to the daily chart for Solana and we're going to turn on this indicator called the TBO. And it is what I use to make every trading decision. I even use the TBO to start my bots. It's a fantastic indicator and has so many things. But the main thing that this thing does is it identifies the strength of the trend and if a trend change might be coming. So let me just break those two things apart. The TBO stands for Trending Breakout Indicator. And here on the daily time frame for the TBO, rather for Solana on the TBO, this little green triangle is our moneymaker. Sometimes this green moneymaker happens and the price does shoot up 50% only to get a pink triangle, which means sell. If you can short, you would actually have done extremely well with the TBO way back here because we were told that we should consider opening a short here at $181 back here in December 2021. If we had taken that advice from the TBO and let it trade out, not only does it get closed out there for 33% profit, which is the short position, so that would be considered profit, we're going to keep writing this all the way down there, another 58% profit without leverage. That's just 58%. Even if you're not using leverage, using this indicator, knowing when the trend is bearish, seeing this is telling you price is probably going to go down, you're going to be able to save 95% of your account by selling when you see the TBO open short. When we look here, right there is our little green friend. If we took our entry here on the TBO open long and we stay in the trend all the way until we get our open short right there, that's a 467% increase. I don't have to say anything else. Yes, I could be trading this chart. I could be using bots. I could accumulate it. Or if I just put $1,000 into this, I would have $4,670 or $77.40. That's a pretty good trade. And the best part about this is that I'm getting alerts on the way up, letting me know that you might want to take some profit. That's all that alert right there is telling us. It's a closed long not to close the position, but that a trend change could be coming. Right here, it actually called it and did a really good job of doing so. So not only did we sell at 467%, but we took profits on the way up. So that way, we actually lock in a good amount of profit. We also have support and resistance lines automatically drawn on the TBO, which is super useful. The part about the TBO that I like the most is the TBO cloud. Now, the TBO cloud can be admittedly a little bit confusing. So we're going to go into here and we're going to turn off everything except for the cloud because the cloud is one of the strongest and most fun ways to trade. It simplifies trading. It helps you to understand the trend. And even without all the symbols, it's very clear what's happening. The cloud right here is comprised of four different moving averages that make the TBO the TBO. When we have this outer line right here, this is called the slow line. This slow line is your money maker. This is letting you know the strength of the trend. And if the slow line is angling down, even if we have a move up, this move up will not be sustained because the daily slow line is telling us, nope, you're going down. If we go to where things turn bullish and the price goes above the cloud, we get the inverse of that where the slow line is now on the bottom. And when we see it angling upward like this, even if we get a pullback like that, I have confidence to buy in, to buy in, and to buy more Solana as this is moving up. Why? Because the trend is telling me that we're going to go up a lot higher. And even though we have a period of consolidation, which means we have sideways price action right in there, and my little Lego block apparently is what that is, it's telling me that the trend is still strong. So if I bought in here, knowing that the TBO slow line is moving up, and I buy the dip at $94, guess what? And I sell up there, and I use the other elements of the TBO, like my closed longs, then I'm going to be taking profit up here at 16%. I'm going to be taking profit here at 61%. 1% like this is all ridiculous. And this is why I like the TBO. It also works well with RSI. When I know that the trend is up, even if we're super overbought and the RSI levels are really high, I'm going to stay with the trend and make the most money I can. The next indicator I want to show you is TBT base to quote converter. So this is a free indicator published by the better traders by us. And all it does is it simply converts the amount of the base currency, which is Bitcoin that's traded and it converts converts it to USDT. So instead of looking at this and going, well, 251 Bitcoin, how much trading volume is that? Well, it tells you here, we have the volume amount, which says $5,193,000. And then we also have a moving average.
average. The moving average is really, really useful. So in order to add this to your chart, you have to hit the little rocket icon and you save it to your favorite indicators. And then you come up here to indicators and you go to your invite only, or no, you go to your favorites, duh, because you saved it as a favorite. And it's TBT based to quote currency converter. Okay. All this does again, is it just converts the currency, which is what we want in crypto. It's a little bit different than the stock market. In the stock market, I can see on the chart how many shares of Amazon or Apple or Nokia were bought. So I can use that right there. I can use volume. It's done. But with crypto, I need to know how much Bitcoin, how much Ethereum, how much BNB or KCS or whatever alternative currency or USD was traded in a particular trading pair. So for this chart for Solana on Coinbase, I know that the 30 day moving average is at about $134 million. Here's a tip with volume. You do not want to crowd the order book. We talked about that. Retrieve that from your short term memory. We do not want to put in more than 10% of the 30 day moving average of volume. That's why this number is here. This is why it's so incredibly useful. So when we're scalping on a low volume, volume chart like Krill BTC. And when I say low volume, I mean it low volume. If we come down here, the 30 day moving average for Krill is at 1.2 Bitcoin. Because we're on an alternative market, this is really helpful for me as an AB trader because now I know, well, I want to make sure that I don't exceed 10% of that. So I don't want to put more than 0.12 Bitcoin into any one trade because I might have problems getting my orders filled, either buying or selling. This indicator is awesome and it's free and it helps me so much, whether it's DCA bot trading, swing trading, or even scalping, it's great. So that's the other indicator that I really like a lot. Our last indicator that's incredibly useful. Let me find a fun chart over here. Let's choose Ren. I'm going to use a clean chart on Coinbase and we are going to, yes, there's the cluster and that's how the cluster works. It did a good job. So we are going to use a fresh chart. I'm going to hide the TBO just for simplicity's sake. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite drawings. It's not really an indicator. It's more of a measurement tool, but it works incredibly well in predicting future price action where the TBO is great at predicting the strength of the trend, the direction of the trend, when there might be a breakout or a breakdown. It doesn't exactly tell me how high the price could go support and resistance levels like this one they're great for plotting future levels based off of the past price so like here for render yeah 13 dollars is going to be a level to beat but could it go up a lot higher and i'll show you how i know that and that's with fibonacci retracements so over here you have your drawing tool or whatever you want kind of want to use your dot or your cross. You have your align tool here, but then we have this fib retracement. Alt F or Alt option F. I think if you're on a Mac computer, now we really want to find the oldest possible chart. And sometimes that means just going to the crypto chart. There we go. So render up here when it was listed back here in November, 2021, terrible time to list a token, but no one could have known. We're going to use the control key or the command key to enable our magnet. We're going to choose the high and we're going to come down all the way here to our very lowest level. And I have a specific template that I use and I teach in the Smarter Trader course. So I'm not going to go into that, but this is essentially just the default levels. Yours may not look like mine because I like to use logarithmic charts. So if you like to use logarithmic charts, which I recommend for crypto, uh, you're going to want to come down here and you're going to want to enable FIB levels based on log scale. Once that's enabled, then you're set to go. These are the levels that I use for Fibonacci. I don't go beyond this for this specific setting. The reason why I like using FIBs is because once we know the extreme high to the extreme low, it plots beautifully where price action will most likely find interference or it might find difficulty breaking above. Exhibit A right here. This specific level is a classic level of resistance, and this is at the 0.618, which is the golden ratio. The Fibonacci drawing tool is based off of the Fibonacci sequence, and this golden ratio sequence is all over nature and it works well in crypto. Now, if it works well in crypto or charting without knowledge of the fibs, that's a different argument altogether. I honestly believe that because people use this indicator and they know it, therefore it's going to work. It's kind of like a group think, group psychology. Everyone has this expectation that it's going to work because everyone's using fibs. Does that make sense? So if everyone's using the Fibonacci retracement levels and we see the price coming up to the 618, well, guess what? We're most likely going to see resistance there. Where does the price fall? Lo and behold, it finds support at the five, goes back up to the 618, and then it falls 
falls down to the five, falls down to the three eight two, hits the five. It's basically ping pong, pong 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 pong, and it finds resistance here. It's trying to break above. It can't. It comes down to the five, finds support, finds resistance, breaks above, support, support, resistance, flips to support, resistance flips to support and here we are the beautiful thing about fibonacci retracements is that you can see this level up here we can see a 272 and a 618 these are my levels that i look for as future price targets i'm not going to go into why and again that's really talked about extensively in the smarter trader course and this is a free course on youtube so you're very much welcome they are getting this much free value but if you want more and you want in-depth trading tips and strategies on how to trade with this thing the smarter trader course has that but these are the four indicators that i love to use on trading view I love to use RSI. I love to use the TBO. I love to use the TBT base to quote currency converter. And I love to use FIB trace or FIB retracements. These are honestly the four things that I use the most, of course, with support resistance levels. But these four things really do a whole lot for my trading portfolio and my profitability. It's fantastic. Technical analysis aside, if you really want to win in crypto, even more important than knowing how to read charts, is mastering your psychology. You have to overcome all the fears, traumas, and doubts that you have about yourself. You need to overcome all of these adversities that come with going one-on-one -on -one with millions of other talented traders. So these are four main principles that you have to understand if you really want to master trading psychology. Probabilistic thinking. Understand that trading is a game of probabilities and not certainties. Focus on the process of making good trades, rather than the outcome of individual trades. Realize that even the best trading strategies will have losing trades. Evaluate your performance based on a large sample size of trades, not just a few. Embrace the concept of expected value and make decisions based on positive expectancy. Detach your self-worth from your trading results. Understand that your worth as a person is not determined by your trading performance or your portfolio size. Separate your identity from your role as a trader. Try to maintain a balanced life outside of trading with hobbies, relationships, and personal growth. Cultivate a growth mindset focusing on learning and improvement rather than perfection. Practice self-compassion and avoid negative self-talk when facing challenges or losses. Take responsibility for your results. Acknowledge that your trading results are a direct consequence or outcome of your own decisions and actions. Avoid blaming external factors such as the market or other traders for your losses. Focus on what you can control such as your trading plan, risk management, and emotional discipline. Regularly review and analyze your performance to identify areas of improvement. Get feedback and guidance from mentors or experienced traders to support your growth. Manage risk effectively. Develop and adhere to a clear risk management plan. Set appropriate stop losses and position sizing based on your account size and risk tolerance. Diversify your portfolio across different markets, timeframes, and strategies to minimize risk. Avoid over trading or taking excessive risk in an attempt to chase profits. Regularly monitor and adjust your risk management plans as your account and market conditions change. Nobody starts out as an expert in anything. Even those who seem to be child prodigies still initially have to be taught and mentored by someone. My business partner and I came up with these five trading rules after spending countless hours reading books from the top authors on trading psychology and listening to experienced traders share the lessons that they've learned over the course of their careers. These five five trading rules are the culmination of that research and will keep you focused, accountable to yourself, and will help you to create a positive trading mindset during all stages of a trade. And they're all found in the Better Traders Journal. Number one, I will create a trading plan from start to finish. This one seems pretty obvious, but the reality is that lots of traders and maybe even sometimes you decide you're just going to buy something without figuring out what are you actually going to do with it? Are you going to buy it and hold it for the long term? Are you going to buy it and sell a little bit at a certain price? Or are you going to buy more if the price falls? You have to decide these things beforehand. The market's going to do whatever it wants. We can make good trading plans, but the trading plans are made with the idea in mind that if 
things go wrong or if the price does this or if it goes down that way, I'm going to do this. It's coming up with your trading plan before you even click the button to buy or sell. Don't just run into trades, plan them out. Number two, I'll follow my trading plan. You'd be surprised how many people actually don't follow through with their trading plan. A lot of people tend to do this in different areas of life too. Yeah, I'm going to get that done tomorrow. I'm going to work on that report and get on your desk by Monday. Okay, that's nice. How are you going to get it done? Or maybe a student trying to figure out how they're going to finish a massive project. If you don't do it without a plan, you're going to be looking at everything going like, this is insane. How am I going to do this? But if you break it up into little different parts or different stages, trading or project planning becomes a lot more easy to handle. Following your trading plan is incredibly value and not enough traders do it. Number three, I will not use more than 10% of my portfolio per trade. You can actually get away with more or less of this, but 10% is a good idea. The reason why I suggest 10% is that it helps you to be picky with the coins that you're going to choose. It helps you to make better decisions. It's way better and way more manageable to take care of 10 positions compared to 50 or 100 or 200 positions. Buying little bits, opening 50 positions up, maybe a couple of them shoot up 50%, 100%, but you've used such a small fraction of your portfolio, you're not going to see a big return on that investment that will benefit your portfolio as a whole. So 10% of your portfolio per trade is not just to restrict you in choosing better charts for trading, but to also help you to grow your portfolio faster. Number four, I'll protect my portfolio at all costs. This is a defense mentality that you need because most people don't use it. People think trading is like gambling, where the higher the stakes, the higher the profits are going to be. Well, that's kind of true sometimes, and you will make some amazing trades, which will give you a high when you're winning, but it's a double-edged sword because you want to use a stop loss as well. While it will hurt to get stopped out in trades, you want to make sure that you are doing everything in your ability to protect your portfolio at all costs because it's your portfolio. It's what you're trying to grow. And number five, I'll be satisfied with any amount of profit. Learning to be satisfied is a difficult task for pretty much any human. The fear of missing out is especially strong in emotional traders and emotional markets like crypto. So the best way that you can learn how to be satisfied with any amount of profit is ask yourself this question. Would you rather take a 5% win or a 5% loss? When you think about taking profits, if you close in the green, you're doing what most traders can't do consistently. Most traders lose money. You need to learn to flip that switch in your mind and to be satisfied with any amount of profit. When you can learn how to be satisfied with any amount of profit and the price goes up higher after you sold, you can learn to go, you know what? I closed in the green. I did what most people can't do consistently because the temptation is when you see the price go up higher, you're going to think, well, I want to buy more of that. That's not your trading plan. I'm feeling really, really angry that the price is going up even higher. That's so what? It's not about your emotions. It's about your trading plan. The whole idea about this rule is that it helps you to learn how to be content with any amount of profit. Crypto is incredibly irrational and emotionally driven. Know that sometimes you're just going to be wrong. You're going to get out too early and the price is going to go up higher. It's okay. If you can get to that mentality, when it comes to making money in crypto, every win will be a celebration. And even if the price goes up higher, you're going to feel happy for the people that are trading that chart. Because why wouldn't you? Learn to be content. Learn to cheer other people on. Learn to be satisfied with any amount of profit. And that is 10 years of crypto wisdom in one video. Video. If you've watched all the way until the end, I want you to leave a comment down below letting me know what I may have missed or what you feel like I might have left out. So that way I can make more and better content to suit what you guys are wanting. If you've watched until this point, you haven't hit the like or subscribe button, slap yourselves and then go ahead and like and subscribe. And until the next time, you know what to do. Stay awesome and stay in the green. Peace.